of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Drew. Let's go back a little bit. There's a story that's told about a town which put on a Good Friday procession through the streets. And the man chosen to portray Jesus this particular year was a big, bulky, kind of burly truck driver kind of a guy, not the meek and mild Savior we've come to see going down the Via Dolorosa. Still, he had his part to play, and he wore the clothing of Jesus. He put the crown of thorns on his head, and he dragged a rugged wooden cross down the street. Now, there was another man who was chosen to play the Roman centurion. He was more in line with the meek and mild Jesus, sort of slight of build, tall and thin. But because they both had their parts to play, they played him to a T. So as truck driver Jesus walked by, the centurion jeered him, mocked him, struck him, and even spat on his face. Well, as you can imagine, that was a bit more than truck driver Jesus could handle. So all of a sudden, he turned around and he said, I'll be back to deal with you after the resurrection. Well, today's gospel lesson, we do hear that Jesus has come back to deal with his disciples after the resurrection. But let me first and foremost say something about the Acts passage today, because I don't appreciate it much, I don't like it, I don't think it's quite correct. Luke, the author of Acts, is trying in the the first century to separate the Christians who are following what is called the way from those who they inherited from as Jewish folk. But many misreadings of this particular passage has led to abuse of our Jewish brothers and sisters. Please know, without equivocation, nothing happened in the Roman world that the Romans did not decide. It was the Romans who put Jesus to death, not the Jews. But even the piece that I want to talk about and focus on a little bit is even before our reading that we heard Drew read. You see, Peter and John had been walking in the temple. This was their custom. It was during prayer time, about three in the afternoon, and they were strolling along, and there was a man who laid there who had been lame from birth, and he was brought there every day to beg, and he was brought next to this uh, gate called Beautiful, and he asked for handouts all day long. Now, as Peter and John followed along, you know, they didn't really have a pastor's discretion fund, or they didn't have a benevolence line item in their budget for this new religion. So they didn't have money to give, but, but they had something much better. Peter says, I have no silver or gold, but what I give you, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he does, but he doesn't. He doesn't walk. He gets up and he begins to dance. This man who had been lame from birth got up and danced, and this is no simple lyrical liturgical dance. This is a jig. His arms are flailing and his legs are kicking. It's that kind of you better stand back from kind of dance that this guy does. And that's what lands us at this text today. Peter says, what are you looking at? In his best Brooklyn accent, what are you looking at, people? I use the name the Jesus name. I used the one who came down the line from the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, glorify Christ. That's whose name I used, glorify Christ to be a force for good and for healing, for love sharing, for joy restoration in this world. Why does that freak you out? Why does that set you on edge? Well, we shouldn't be so hard because if you'd seen that dance, maybe you'd be a little freaked out too. It's almost too much to believe. They saw the man there every day laying there begging for handouts because he'd been lame since birth. And people had only ever seen Jesus do that kind of healing. So perhaps we should cut him a little slack. It perhaps was a little bit too much to believe. And speaking of hard to believe, picture this from our Luke passage, a locked room, a shadowy kind of room where only candles are lit and all the windows are boarded up and there's a 
a covering of smoke from the candles. It's very dark and it's very, very quiet. As we just heard from the passage, it's Sunday evening. This passage in Luke comes just after the road to Emmaus experience. The disciples in Emmaus had sped back to Jerusalem to tell about their encounter at that meal with the one who was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. So here's the scene, right? This scene with me. Easter morning has come and gone. The disciples are in this locked away room. They'd spent the entire day talking about the fact that Jesus had actually been raised from the dead. They were fired up. They were making plans about what they're going to do, how they're going to spread the word, how they're going to continue the ministry that Jesus taught them all the things to perform, right? That's what they were doing. Not quite, right? No, they weren't talking about going anywhere. The sun had set that Sunday evening. The disciples had gathered in that room they used before. They locked it up for fear that they might be the next ones dragged to a cross. They were in hiding. They were overwhelmed by the events of the week before. They were still afraid that they would be the next to be arrested and killed. So we really can't blame them, can we? I mean, even with the stories being told by Mary and Peter and a few of the others about how they had saw the tomb that morning, the empty tomb, it still, it still must have been pretty overwhelming to make sense of all that had happened. Though our Easter celebration might include bells and trumpets and the hallelujah chorus, on that Easter, Jesus shows up suddenly in a very quiet, shadowy room. He simply says, peace be with you. Peace. Be at peace. Be at peace in your hurt. Be at peace in your confusion and be at peace in your doubt. Then he gifted them. He gifted them with the Holy Spirit. It says he opened their minds. He imparted to them his presence. He was with them. It was a presence that was never going to leave them. Christ would now live within their hearts in times of their doubt and the despair, Christ would be among them. Christ would be with them. Christ would be among them. And as we stand in that long line of succession, Christ is among us as well. It's surprising. Yet it's not, right? Hadn't he been surprising them from day one? Hadn't everything he had done with the disciples all along the way been very surprising? Didn't he teach things that were against the religion or a re reformation of the religion that they had been practicing all their lives? He turned their religion on the ear. Didn't he shock them and eat with the wrong crowd? Not, not once, but over and over and over again. Didn't he paint a different figure of God as loving and forgiving and not the guy, the God, the eye for an eye kind of vengeful one that they had in their holy books? Hadn't he healed person after person? Hadn't he cast out demons? Hadn't he restored vision? Hadn't he made the lame to leap and the lepers whole again? And now they're shocked? It's incredulous. How could they be? He had been shocking them from day one. Peter, at the end of the Acts passage, says, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. Isn't that the height of hypocrisy? This guy, something about a rooster, and he was going to deny Jesus? Peter's denial, the height of hypocrisy here. Jesus told them over and over again that he was going to suffer and die and rise on the third day, and they were ignorant of that. Our gospel writer Luke says, you have little faith. Other gospel writers say, you have no faith. You're going to call others out now, Peter? 
It's hypocrisy. But it's, it's the age-old problem, is it not? If we're honest, we're all hypocritical from time to time. Someone once said the church is a meeting of the hypocrites, reformed hypocrites, but hypocrites nonetheless. And we keep coming back here to hear again these old stories, to be reminded that we have fallen short, to recommit ourselves to trying harder next week, coming to a place where Christ is among us here, but taking that spirit of Christ to be among others out there. Jesus opened their minds, filled them with understanding, and sent them out. Repentance and forgiveness, he said, is to be preached in my name to all nations. Beginning here in Jerusalem, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. Jesus did not command the whole world to go to church. Jesus commanded the church to go to the whole world. Let me say that again. Jesus didn't command the world to go to church. He commanded the church to go to the world. There's a story told about an explorer who had a lifelong quest to go and explore the Amazon. And so off he went. And the people at home were eager to find out and learn about all the things that he had seen, about this vast and mighty river and all the country surrounding it. So off he went to do his exploration. And along the way, he wondered this charge from the people back home, how he was going to explain to them what it was like. How could he describe to them? How could he ever put into words the feelings that flooded his heart when he saw those exotic flowers and heard those night sounds of the jungle? How could he communicate to them the smells that filled the air and the sense of danger and excitement that would come whenever he and his fellow explorers encountered strange animals or paddled through some treacherous rapids? How could he do that? So he did what all good explorers do. He said to the people, go and find out for yourself what it's like. Go and find out what it's like for yourselves. And so he decided to help them. He drew a map of that river. And he illustrated it very meticulously. He talked about the surrounding countryside and the animals. And he pointed out some danger spots. And he pointed out the spots that he loved and the, and the flowers. And it was a very detailed and beautiful map. He gave it to the people. And he said, here, now go explore. Take this beautiful map. And you know what they did? They framed it. And they put it on a wall. They framed it. And they put it on a wall. They had this great resource among them. This man who had sent them out gave them a map, and they framed it, put it on a wall. They thought they could experience the Amazon by just looking at the map. They thought they could live and explore life by just studying that map. In similar fashion, I think. Christians can perpetuate the same mythical life, can't we? Just coming to worship, which is very important. Just coming to Bible study, which is very important. Just putting money into the plate. Oh, please, stewardship board, hear me. It's very important. Very important. But sometimes we think we can just read about the Christian life or hear about the Christian life, and we will have... A Christian life. Can we? Professor Harold Hill convinced the people that he was a great music director in a long line of great music directors. He was going to save the wayward youth of River City from their pool hall by forming a band. But we all know he was going to collect money for instruments and for uniforms, and then he was going to skip town. Along the way, they asked him, what about the music lessons? And he said, I developed something called the think system. All you have to do is think, and the notes will come. Well, that makes for a good Broadway and Hollywood script. It works in that particular venue. 
Though music playing does involve a great deal of thinking. We know that Broadway miracle is as fake as the promise of instruments and uniforms. In similar fashion, we can't just only think our way into being Christian. Christ didn't command us to merely go to church. He invited His church to go into the world. Christ would be among us, and as we were taking Christ to the world, He would be among us there. He wanted us to take that amongness out into the world. A Civil War chaplain approached a wounded soldier on the battlefield and asked if he'd like to hear a few verses from the Bible, a few comforting verses from the Bible. And the wounded man said, no, but I'm thirsty. I'd rather have a glass of water. So the chaplain gave him a drink and then repeated his question about some Bible verses. He said, no, sir, not now, but could you put something underneath my head? And so the chaplain did so and again asked his question about verses from the Bible. No, no, said the soldier, I'm cold. Could you cover me up? And the chaplain took off his inside coat and wrapped the soldier but was afraid after that to ask his question to repeat the request if he wanted to hear some verses. And so he began to take his leave of the wounded soldier. But the soldier called him back. He said, look, chaplain, if there's anything in that book of yours that makes a person do for another person what you've done for me, then yes, I want to hear about it. I want to hear about it. Jesus said we were to be his witnesses. So I simply ask you this morning, what kind of witnesses are you going to be? What kind of witness are you going to be? Now, I'm not leading a tent revival. I don't want you to come down here and kneel unless you want to. But perhaps when someone is alone, or afraid, or in their own locked up room, perhaps, maybe you can be a word that comes to them and speaks peace. Maybe you can take them a cup of water, maybe a comforting pillow or a warm blanket that you can offer. To have Christ among us. We need to do more than think about it. We need to be it. We need to be it for the world. Amen.